Hello and welcome everyone. I'm so happy to be here today. It's an honor for our IEEE Women in Engineering Network. It's open to everyone and uh, I, I'm very delighted to introduce our host and our speakers today. Um, so please, if I may just share my screen with you, if that, that is okay. Mm, so we have today our 10th early career talk. Um, and this is a series of online and technical inspirational talks. My name is Jana. I'm a PhD student currently in electrical engineering, and I'm also an IEEE Women in Engineering ambassador. I recently joined because I was so much supported by our host, Dr. Nagam Saeed. Um, she was very, very kind, and um, I was previously presenting during the ninth early career talk, and I'm very honored to be able to co-host this event today. Please, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Nagam Saeed to you. Uh, she's our host and she organized this event with passion and um, we look forward to all of our speakers today. So please, Dr. Saeed, if I may introduce you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jana. Thank you. Um, thank you for agreeing to be a co-host. We really enjoyed your talks on the ninth uh, early career talk. And thank you for being a co-host today, being an ambassador today. So that's the aim. And we, we are very delighted because you've been encouraged and inspired to join our network and looking forward to work with you on uh, uh, other projects as well. So hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Nagam Saeed. I'm the IEEE Women in Engineering in the United Kingdom and Ireland Chair. I'm also the early uh, professional lead uh, and the ambassador network lead as well. Uh, and that's my, what I'm doing uh, as part of our affinity group. So I would like to welcome and thank everyone for joining the 10th Early Career Talks webinar. Uh, this one is organized by the Ambassador team. And a warm welcome to our speakers and our audience from all over the world. This is a unique experience to witness four different technical talks uh, talking about the recent development in technology and research. So today talks, they are tackling different technical subjects, for example, satellites, system, biomedical instrumentation, organic electronics and renewable integration. So our affinity group uh, aim is to uh, create activities to promote women in technology, as well as uh, creating a culture of diversity and inclusion. And you can tell today that we, will, we are trying to do that by hosting uh, Somia. We would like uh, to work together to improve early profession uh, outreach. Uh, and we want to reach out to engineers and uh, uh, computing um, uh, students, uh, uh, undergraduate and postgraduate, and support them as much as we can. So I'm really looking forward to listen to today today talks and discussion. And back to you, Dr. Yana. Thank you so much, Dr. Yana. Um, thank you very much for this inspirational welcome. Um, today's first speaker would be. Hasim, she is from the University of Nottingham, and uh, she would be presenting now. Um, I, I would like to introduce her, and uh, please, uh, Hasim, would you like to share your screen? Yes, uh, hi everyone. Uh, just firstly, I would like to thank all the um, uh, organizers for uh, organizing such uh, a valuable event, and also I would like to thank Dr. Nagam for uh, inviting me today uh, to be a speaker for uh, today's event. And also, I'd like to appreciate uh, all the attendees for being here today. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Tasneem Youssef, and uh, I'm a PhD student at Nottingham Geospatial Institute. Uh, today, I'm going to give you an overview about the GNSS applications, and I'm going to focus more into the GNSS applications in space. Just to provide you with a brief overview about my background, uh, I have a Bachelor of Science in Computer Engineering from University of Bahrain, 
uh, and then in 2019, I got my Master of Science in Electronic Communication and Computer Engineering from the University of Nottingham. And also, I worked in industry as a system engineer at the Benefit Company in Bahrain. And then I moved to academia to work as a lecturer at the University of Technology in Bahrain. Uh, in 2022, I started my PhD uh, in electrical and electronics engineering, uh, and I am a PhD candidate at Nottingham Geospatial Institute. I'm officially in my second year now. Uh, I got my scholarship and funding uh, through Engineering and Physical Science Research, uh, Research Council, UKRI, and also University of Nottingham International Scholarship in, in, Excel, in, in Excellence Engineering Research. Beside that, I am a team member of AstroJam CubeSat. Uh, my research areas are related to GNSS receivers, the GNSS interference monitoring, uh, reconfigurable computing using FPGA, and also machine learning. Beside my volunteering working, I am IEEE member, Women in Engineering, Young Professional, uh, communication, uh, communication Society, Computer Society. Also, I'm a member of IET. Uh, additionally, I am a member of Nottingham Space Society and Engin Engineering Research Society at University of Nottingham. So today's presentation will be organized in the following way. So firstly, I'm going to introduce you with the GNSS and how it works. Then I'm going to give, to describe the GNSS signals and how weak are these uh, GNSS signals. And after that, I'm going to talk about the GNSS applications then I'm going to focus more into the recent GNSS application in space. Finally, I'm going to conclude with the future use and my current research work. So let's start off with a, gen with a general overview of the GNSS. GNSS actually is one of the existing fields that has a massive growth industry in, uh, in academic and in, uh, in, uh, in industry. So GNSS stands for a Global Navigation Satellite System. It's actually a collective term for all worldwide navigation system that provides 3D position, velocity, and time by utilizing passive ranging using radio signal transmitted by the surrounding satellites. So uh, GNSS has two uh, two two uh, kind of uh, system. So there is a global genus system. Global mean it's orbiting around the globe. So it will, the, the system will orbiting all over the world. And we have regional genus system, which mean these kind of satellites are orbiting only uh, uh, around their countries. So for the global genus system, we have four main uh, system. The first and the popular one is the GPS. It's by uh, United States. And then we have the Galileo uh, by Europe. And we have the GLONASS uh, by Russia. And B2 is the Chinese system. And for, for the regional genus system, we will have the QZSS, which is Japanese system. And we have NAVIC, which is Indian, uh, Indian genus system. So if you try uh, actually to pick up your phone and you download, download one of the applications such as uh, Genius S View, you will you will try to see all of the all, all of the signal from these different uh, global Genius S system. Not like all of you may be aware of only GPS. However, you can connect your phone with any of these global uh, Genius S systems. So this picture just to describe you the number of satellites for each one of the global GNSS systems. So for example, for the GBS, we have uh, 31 satellites. For Galileo, we have 24. For GLONASS, we have 24 satellites as well. And for the BID, we have uh, 35 satellites. So we have quite big number of satellites at the moment, not like in previous years, we have only few number of satellites. Just to give you a, a brief overview about Galileo, Galileo is created by European Space Agency, which is called ESA, and also European Union. It has 24 satellites that orbiting over three orbits, so we'll have eight satellites for each orbit, and they are located in medium Earth orbit. Just to clarify, there is low Earth orbit, there is medium Earth orbit, and there is high uh, Earth orbit. The low medium, uh, the low Earth orbit, the altitude is almost almost 2,000 kilometer. The medium Earth orbit is between 2,000 kilometer and uh, uh, 35,786 kilometer. And the high uh, Earth orbit is higher than uh, 35,786 kilometer. For
Galileo, the satellites are orbiting in the medium Earth orbit, and the reason is because they need a more coverage. The antenna need more coverage, not like uh, maybe CubeSats or other spacecraft. They will need just to be in the low Earth orbit because they do not, they don't need uh, too much coverage. However, the Galileo satellite need uh, much coverage. That's why it has to be farther away from the Earth. Also, Galileo provide a very, very accurate uh, position, so the precision can reach to minus one meter, which is three feet by three inches, so it's even more accurate than the GPS. It can take up to 14 hours to orbit to the Earth, and also the, the new or the modern program also contain standard feature that allow GPS, GLONASS, and Galileo to interoperate together, which will allow to develop, to utilize GPS and the GLONASS and Galileo together to create an even more accurate uh, um, uh, genus S signal, and also this will improve the reliability uh, precision for the, posi the positioning data. The second popular one, which I'm sure all of you uh, know, which is the GPS. GPS stands for Global Positioning System that provides the location and time information in all weather condition anywhere in the Earth. And it has created by the United States Department of Defense. So actually, it was actually meant to be for only military application. However, nowadays it's used for a mini civilian application. It has 24 satellites uh, on the U.S. consultation and also four satellites in each of the six orbit plans uh, it's it's a transmit it, it's a transmitted in a uh, in a uniquely coded radio signal it can cover 24 hours in a day and seven days in a week and also they have a very very accurate atomic clock how the system work in genus is we will have three main segments. The first one is the space segment. Space segment will contain all the satellites or the spacecraft or the space station. And then we have the control segment. Control segment, which is basically referred to the, G, the, to the ground based, in, uh, based infra infrastructure that is responsible for monitoring, managing, controlling the space segment. And then we will have the user segment, which receive the signal from the satellite. And as you can see, there is one arrow, so the transmission is only passive transmission so it's only receiving the genus the 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 signal from the satellites and then you can do uh, we can do in the air's data modeling such as uh, binary phase shift decaying or code division multiple access so we will do this all in downlinking or uh, on the post processing uh, 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 segment so how strong are these gnss signals GNSS receive power level is very, very, very weak. So, for example, the GPS has a minimum receive power level that reached to minus 158.5 ppm watt. So, it's very, very weak. So, how are these calculated and what are the transmitted power and can we see the signals? So, to answer this question, just to clarify, as you can see from this picture, we have the satellite. The satellite is trying to transmit the signal from the space to the air. So we will have to calculate some of the parameter before ending up with the received power uh, level. So first of all, we'll have the transmit power. Transmit power referred to the satellite transmit power. And we have the transmit antenna again, again for the, for the satellite. And we, after adding these together, we will end up by calculating the, EI, the EIRB, which is referred to effective astrophic radiated power. It's a calculation used to estimate the radiated uh, output power on astrophic antenna. And then we will have the propagation laws. Propagation laws actually refer to the past laws, which is the reduction or the reduce in the power density because the signal is propagated in the space. And then we will have the atmospheric laws. Atmospheric laws will not affect too much on the satellite signal. Atmospheric laws mean the reduction of the power density of the electro, uh, electromagnetic wave as it, pulse, uh, as it pass from the atmosphere. And also we will have the polarization laws. So if you your, if your phone, for example, have a weak antenna and have it, the polarization will be again with weak, so you will have some loss also, and then you will you will have the receive uh, antenna again for for example for your phone for, for your phone will act as the receiver. 
if you if you add up the BT and the GT and the GR and then you subtract all of these losses you will end up by getting the received power level and of course you can do it in logarithm or in the linear format so just to give you an example so as I said the minimum received power for the GPS is mi minus 158.5 the, the uh, polarization loss will be 3 dB. Receive antenna gain will be 3 dB. For example, for the batch antenna, propagation loss is the biggest amount, as I mentioned, because it's traveled through a very, very far distance from the space to the airs. And then we have the atm atmospheric loss, not too much amount. And then we have the IRB, which is the uh, power transmission with the gain uh, transmission. The antenna gain will be around 15.2 the uh, transmission power will be 11.2. So can you imagine 11.2 dB, dB watt has been reduced to minus 158.5 dB watt, which means it's a very, very weak uh, uh, power level. So the shape of the genus S signal, if you can see the first picture represent the Galileo and the GPS signal from the simulator, the simulator called Skydel, which is located in our research group. And you can see this gray, it's referred to the Gaussian noise. The black line is the thermal noise. So we can see the, G and the genus S signal is almost um, down or below the thermal noise, so it's very, very hard to be detectable. But thankfully, due to the digital signal uh, processing technique, we can be able to detect the genus S signal through uh, code division, uh, multiplexer, uh, multiple axis, or other uh, mo uh, data modeling. The second picture represents the uh, again the uh, GPS um, or the genus S signal with the three format, which is frequency uh, domain blot. If you can see, there is one, one high spike. This is actually a, a self-interference uh, signal, and we have the time domain and also the, histo uh, the histogram format. So what are the current GNSS applica the applications or why we care about GNSS actually? GNSS has been used for a variety of applications, whether it's related to military or civilian application. So for civilian application, it has been used for surveying, mapping, uh, for marine time, for example, it can use for search and rescue for of sinking uh, visas, also monitoring of fishing field, observing the changes of sea life, also, it can be used for land and environmental management, natural disaster monitoring. Uh, also, it can be used for uh, navigation and tracking. So, all of us use Google Map uh, 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 in, in, in uh, every day almost, and also uh, uh, while driving, uh, such as the car uh, navigation set device. Uh, for aviation, for example, so it can be used for attitude determination or traffic control for architecture also, so it can use for precision farming, uh, water management, uh, or soil surveying and mapping management and animal disease and control. So it can be used for a very, a lot, a lot, uh, a lot of applications. Uh, this is actually just a few of the application uh, that I mentioned. One of the most demand, uh, demanding application is nowadays is the space. And I'm going to give you more example about the Genesis application in space. So uh, before going to the space, uh, just to mention uh, GNSS can save our lives. Yes, it can save our lives. So GNSS system not only used for civilian application, but also it can use for disaster application. So their technology can contribute to the monitoring and prediction of activities such as earthquakes, land, uh, land slides. Additionally, they can uh, use to detect sign of vol volcanic inflation and fault uh, movement. So it's really critical in protective disaster management. I remember last year I went to uh, a Titanic Museum in Southampton and I found a very interesting sign at the end of the exhibition. It say that if uh, beacon uh, technology was exist uh, uh, at the Titanic, this will uh, avoid the, tr the tragic uh, the disaster of Titanic. So it's really stated that the genus S system can play a main role in, in avoiding disasters and save lives. 
So what are the current G Genesis application in space? So as I mentioned, Genesis, Genesis is used for navigation solution in airs. So it will be used at the same for the space. So it can provide position, velocity, and time for spacecraft. Also, it can help for orbital maneuvering and rendezvous. Maneuvering means it's a change made to the orbit of a spacecraft that could involve changing of its altitude and inclination or the shape of its uh, of its orbit. So, for example, if there is a spacecraft that might need to change its orbit to avoid space debris, to prepare for rendezvous with another spacecraft or the transition from an initial launch orbit to its final orbit, uh, uh, operational orbit. Rendezvous may refer to the uh, process that two, sp two spacecraft want to get together. It's a really, really complex procedure that requires precise navigation and control. So actually, Genesis is used for this as well. Finally, it can use to self-determine their position so we can reduce the, de the dependence on the ground-based station so this will definitely reduce the cost one, minute one left. of the good uh, one minute left or less <laughs> yes. yeah one of the good benefits also for the genesis application something called above the consultation so i will just uh, don't not go in details but uh, if you can see this uh, white uh, icon refer to the uh, genesis satellite and we have this black box referred to the user spacecraft. If you can see this user spacecraft try to get the signal uh, from the uh, Genesis satellite. However, the Earth is blocking this Genesis signal. However, it can still receive the signal from the uh, side loop of the antenna. One of the also uh, good uh, application which I'm going to conclude with is the Genesis reflectometry. It's one of the trending application which is an infinite, uh, innovative technique for remote sensing that used reflected signal for navigation consultation to remind the uh, air surface. It can use for allometry, uh, soil moisture monitoring, weather forecasting. I'm just going to, uh, this is actually the upcoming mission that University of Nottingham is involving, and I'm going to be part of this mission as my code will, will be using for testing. So I will show you a very interesting video just to um as i mentioned it used for different remote sensing in the airs So we'll have two satellites. One is sending the signal to the Earth and the reflected sing signal is getting by the uh, GNSS reflectometry, which is hydrogenesis in our case, which is the upcoming mission. Again, it's used for predicting the weather, wind speed data, and so on. Um, this is also another mission that handled by Siri Satellite uh, Technology Company that uh, the objective is to get the wind speed data all over the world. And also, uh, fly, uh, just to mention, Genesis can use for lo lunar mission. So it enable autonomous navigation, reduce tracking and operation cost, provide a backup redundant navigation for human safety. One of the projects that handled- Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your talk. I think the time is, is run out. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks. Can we move? Thank you so much, Tazim. Um, uh, it is a, such an impressive talk and really congratulations on, on uh, this amazing achievement. I wanted just to emphasize that um, how much work experience as a senior systems engineer you already had in, uh, in your work and uh, also how much you engage uh, doing outreach with uh, the IEEE community, also with the Talented Student Center. And please, everyone, feel free to reach out to Tasneem because of her impressive portfolio if you're interested in FPGA, in um, uh, IoT and DNSS receivers, please reach out to Tasneem. Um, if we can have maybe one question uh, for Tasneem because um, we received some questions. Um, may I please ask uh, Tasneem, um, what are the kinds of in interferences that affect the GNSS signals? 
Yes, actually, uh, as I mentioned, GNSS has a very weak uh, power level uh, power level of the receive signal, so that's why it can be easily jammed by different kind of interference. So there is uh, uh, just to mention there is two type of interference. There is intentional and unintentional interference. So the intentional interference, such as the jammer and the jammer interference, can be continuous wave, sweeping wave, uh, pulse continuous wave and also spoofing signal uh, when it comes to the un unintentional interference which means it's ac accidental interference this can be happened by radio frequencies such as from kind of devices like television uh, some of the poor antenna can interfere the genus signal also multibus multibus mean due to the building or the infrastructure in the airs so all of these kind of interference can affect uh, badly or uh, dramatically genus signal which we we are targeting to mitigate and detect this kind of interference to avoid uh, uh, such a disaster and also to increase the signal to noise ratio of the genus signals thank you so so much this was a very detailed answer and i really enjoyed the talk anyone please if you have any questions feel free to email Tasneem. Um, we will provide the email addresses of all the presenters and if you would like to engage with Tasneem and all of her outreach activities which she does with ieee and other organizations please feel free also to reach out to us and to Tasneem as well please if i may introduce our next speaker and thank you very much Tasneem. um our next speaker um is um Dr. Sumya uh, Maji, he uh, did his bachelor, master's and PhD in electronics and communication engineering, did a postdoc in the USA and came back now as a, a medical electronics lecturer at the University of Galway in Ireland. And uh, we will have a talk uh, with the title of design of micropower ECG pre-amplifier for dry textile electrodes. I really look forward to it. And please, if um, may I um, give the floor to Sumia. Uh, thank you, Anna. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, uh, now Professor Nagam, for giving this wonderful platform uh, to uh, to give, highlight all my research activities during my PhD. Uh, we'll start sharing my screen. Let me know, guys, if you can see my screen. We can. You can, right? Okay. So, hello everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Somia, as uh, Jan mentioned, and uh, I am a lecturer in medical electronics at the University of Galway in the Republic of Ireland. Today, I'm here to present uh, my research work on the design of a micropower ECG preamplifier for dry textile electrodes. Before I kick off uh, my actual talk, uh, let's look at my background and where I come from. So I come from Kolkata, a metropolitan city in Northeast India, where I completed my undergraduate majoring in electronic engineering. I moved to UCD Ireland to obtain the master's degree majoring in electronics and computer engineering. During my PhD tenure in Trinity College Dublin, I worked on the design of low power bioelectronic circuits, which is essentially the focus of my talk today. I was also involved with Intel Ireland as a product development engineer, where I actively engaged in integrating and timely releasing of key Intel microprocessors and chipsets. After working over a year in Intel Ireland, I returned to academia as a postdoc research fellow at Harvard University. At Harvard, I investigated the design and development of portable medical devices to assess various senses and recovery from neurological impairments and disease progression. Thereafter, I moved back to Ireland to take up a lectureship role focusing on medical electronics at the University of Galway. At Galway, I plan to build uh, and uh, train the next generation engineers working on low power by instrumentation for continuous health monitoring, flexible sensor development, and assisted devices for neurohabilitation. To kick off uh, my actual talk, uh, let's understand the medical instrumentation system pipeline and where I'm going to focus all my energy in this pipeline. So at the start, you have some form of biosensing electrodes, and these electrodes sense various physiological signals, such as ECG, EMG, and so on. And uh, these signals are very extremely low in amplitude, uh, typically can range from 500 microvolts to about 10 millivolts, and they ex exhibit some amount of high impedance. Following on from this sensing electrode block, 
you have uh, the analog front end block, which consists of typically a potential amplifier followed by some kind of circuit enhancement and analog to a digital converter. The bipotential amplifier, it amplifies this low physiological signals, uh, low amplitude physiological signals with high gain, and you want to maintain this amplified signal within the bandwidth. Now, the amplifier must also exhibit really, really high input impedance uh, to counter the high impedance shown or exhibited by the sensing electrodes. Also, in addition, you the amplifier should show some kind of stability against temperature and various voltage fluctuations. The circuit enhancement block is particularly targeted to reduce the power line interferences, which is pretty annoying if any of you, one of you have any experience regarding various forms of physiological signals. It should typically provide various forms of electrical isolation of the amplifier and provide protection against different shocks and so on. The analog to digital converter also should ensure proper bandwidth and provide high resolution of signal recording, uh, also providing uh, low noise. Uh, following on from that, you have some form of a data processing block, which consists of a digital signal processing uh, element to remove various types of motion artifacts and so on. In modern times, many engineers use machine learning models to classify uh, between various health conditions, uh, such as healthy, non healthy and so on and so forth. Uh, one of the key challenges in this area is the element of power, because power consumptions can be pretty high, so people are move, moving, can we find ML algorithms that consume little to no power. And the last final block, you have some kind of uh, Bluetooth low energy, where you want to transmit the recorded data to either this Bluetooth or also even uh, to uh, Wi-Fi. So my talk will first focus on why this sensing electrodes is extremely important, especially in the context of ECG recording. So let's understand that. So why focus on sensing electrodes? Typically, there are three main categories of the sensing electrodes. One, the wet gel electrode, which is uh, the gold standard electrodes currently used in clinics. And then you have various form of conductive rubber electrodes and the textile modern days textile based electrodes, sometimes woven in wearable garments. But here are the problems. One, the, these electrodes, they exhibit really high impedance and they impact the signal morphologies. And two, the designers often neglect the effect of source impedance and noise when evaluating the amplifier performance. And finally, the international standards is often looked overlooked by the designers that ensures diagnostic signal reproduction. Over here, by international standards, I mean the standards that are published by the International Electrotechnical Commission, the IC60601, and the American Heart Association, and so on and so forth. So in my PhD, I first designed the novel current source circuit as low as half a microamp to characterize the skin impedance. And then this skin impedance properties, they're extremely important to gain insight into the amplifier performance. And then that allowed me to establish the design criteria for the amplifiers to enable diagnostic ECG recordings, particularly with dry electrodes. In that process, I also happened to identify a shortfall in the IC60601 standard pertaining to electrocardiographic recording, and I recommended revisions of the standards. These revisions are expected and are due uh, in late 2023. Also designed a really high gain instrumentation amplifier to measure the skin electrode interface noise, which is also extremely important and crucial uh, to ensure proper uh, record, diagnostic recording of any physiological signal. And here is the most critical element. The most of the designers, the sensor designers, they focus only on the material properties of performance evaluation. And in that process, they neglect the electrical properties, which can lead to clinical misinterpretation and therapy, which I'm gonna show you later in the slide. So I have talked about electrical impede, elect skin electrode impedance quite a lot. Let's understand how do you measure it. So the skin electrode interface impedance can be modeled as a single time constant model, uh, which has a single uh, CP and RP parallel as you can circuit, as you can see towards your right. And then you have uh, some form of uh, series resistance, RS, which represents uh, the subcutaneous or the deeper tissues of the skin. And then you have an accurate time, uh, two time constant models, 
governed by CP1, RP1, and CP2, RP2. Now, how do you go on and measure about this? I'm not going to get into the circuit details. It was already published in this paper. Um, but the idea, the fundamental idea stays here that you have a current source which switches on and off using a relay driver. So you have 30 seconds on and 30 seconds off. And then the current flows through one electrode. And there is another electrode, the same electrode is you're grounded to the other electrode. And you, when you measure the voltage drop across the electrodes using a buffer amplifier, you should be able to see a waveform towards your right, which you can see like you have the 30 seconds on and 30 seconds off, and which has a clear distinct rise phase and a fall phase. And you have those two governing equations for a single time constant model and a double time constant model. And the electrode impedance was measured on the clinical gold standard gel electrodes. It had a conductive rubber and four different types of textile based electrodes. Let's look into the results. So the measurements were carried out on the abdomen and the arm, and you can see uh, the values. They're really, really extremely high. The abdomen, uh, well, uh, the, the resistance at the abdomen was a little bit uh, smaller than the arm. The arm mainly because some people tend to have body hairs, and of course their resistance can go higher up. But the fundamental critical element from this result is that you can see that the amplifier resistance is somewhat dependent on this electrode property. So measuring or getting having an idea of this proper skin electrode uh, interface properties is extremely crucial. So you can see both for single CR and double CR and these values, the RN values is dependent on CP or RP or CP1 or RP1 or CP2 or RP2, irrespective of whatever models you use. And um, if you look at some of the values of RPs and CPs, it's like 10 mega ohms. So if you use those in, in the equations, it can give an R, RN value as high as 10 gig ohms, which is, uh, which is an extremely important element uh, uh, we should remember from the slide. Now, what's the implications of failing to meet the RN requirements? I've talked about like why we need a higher RN. Everybody knows, and I've established the design rules, like, oh, this is the amount of RN that I need. So the IC60601 stipulates that in response to a narrow pulse having an amplitude of three millivolts, 100 milliseconds pulse duration, the undershoot from the baseline of the pulse shouldn't exit, ex, uh, exceed 100 microvolts. And the recovery slope at that point shouldn't exceed 300 microvolts per second. That's well and good. But how does it correlate to an actual ECG signal? Here's the thing. When I used an uh, input resistance of 10 mega ohms, which exists in the literature of the IC60601, and I used several electrode models, 10 of these, uh, that was also published in the literature, and I could see that there is a false ASO wave creation, and there is a distortion in the ST segment, which has its clinical misinterpretation, uh, that it can be diagnosed as signs of myocardial infarction or myocardial ecmia, even though you don't have it. But when I use the recommended RN value that I showed you in the previous slide with all the equation, you can see that at the, out, at the output of these, all these electrode models, the ECG signal tracks the input without having shown any signs of distortion. This is the critical element here. So moving on from the skin electrode impedance, let's look into the noise. And uh, I must say that it exists in the literature that you know the dry electrodes in tend to be extremely noisy or rather intrinsically noisy, uh, but there was little to no evidence uh, that exists in the literature to back up this claim. So I wanted to look into the electrode noise. And this was the cool circuit, a very simple uh, to e and easy to implement circuit that I implemented. And first I wanted to understand how much uh, the circuit itself produces noise and could see that, you know, uh, the noise peak to peak, about one and a half millivolts peak to peak, I somehow tallies with what I see in the bench. This was the theoretical calculation I had. So that verified it. But I also wanted to see the spectrogram and I could see like, can I see the spectrogram and somehow um, fit a model to it? And when I did it, I found that there was a distinct like a one over F noise and then there was a white noise. So you could fit a model like K over F plus C uh, kind of a way. And then I tested on six different subjects and with the six different uh, electrodes. And you can see, irrespective of the number of subjects and irrespective of uh, uh, the type of electrodes, the amplifier noise turns out to be higher in all the cases. So it busted the myth that you know the electrodes are intrinsically noisy. It didn't. What actually happens in a low power 
amplifier context is most of these low power amplifiers tend to have a higher noise current. So when you have a higher noise current, it flows through a high source impedance, of course it is going to create a high noise voltage. So if you can somehow find an amplifier that is really high, that is, that is really low noise current, of course you can enable diagnostic EC recording. Coming back to this pipeline again, uh, I have unfolded the mix of the sensing electrodes. Let's look into and get into this amplifier block, particularly the bipotential amplifier, which is one of the critical elements of my uh, research. The motivation for this is, well, we have a lot of commercial ECG ICs. What's the need of another amplifier? Well, if you look some of these commercial ICs, they don't utilize the international performance standards that govern diagnostic recording of the ECG signal, and they also don't utilize the high value of source impedance as high as 10 mega ohms. So of course, the, per the performance of these, uh, these ICs are going to flunk when you consider uh, the high value of electrode uh, impedance. And the last one is the high power consumption of the IC. I mean, they are in milliwatts. We are developing more and more sensors. So low power is a really critical piece here. And um, I have, the goal of my work was to design something that consumes as little as 100 microwatts. So the contributions really was build an amplifier that's diagnostic, follow the IC 601, 601 standards, utilize electrode impedance as high as 10 mega ohms to assess the performance of the amplifier, and you want to do all of these cool things at a low, low power. This is the final amplifier circuit that I built where I had three different stages. The first stage essentially targets to boost the input impedance to 10 giga ohms using a very noble cool technique uh, called the power boot supply bootstrapping. The second stage is particularly targeted for CMR, high CMR measurements. And, and the third stage essentially is a differential to a single ended conversion. Uh, the overall gain of this amplifier was about 110 and it was implemented in uh, surface mounted technology, as you can see, as operating from a, a 3.7 lithium battery. If I have to compare the performance of my amplifier with the other notable works that existed in the literature, you can see, as I mentioned, the gain was 110, the input impedance was boosted to 10 gigaohms from 0.1 to 150 hertz. The CMR One was- One minute left. Sorry? One minute left. Okay, I'll conclude. Uh, the CMR was measured 84 dBs at power line mean interference, and the noise was 32 microvolts peak to peak at 250 hertz, uh, and the power supply was 130 microwatts. Uh, one critical element I'm, uh, I'm going to speak about is um, this measurements utilizes the source impedance as high as 10 megaohms, but the other notable works didn't, uh, and that's the important message here. Uh, and this was the typical ECG recordings which I carried out during COVID, so I really didn't get as many sub subjects as I would li have liked. But you can see here from the take-home message that there was no distortion identified apart from the semiconductor noise present in the re recording. All the morphologies are particularly clear, PQ, RST segment, they are extremely clear. When I measured with both the ele wet electrodes and also the textile electrodes. To conclude my talk and provide a glimpse into the future, the clinical aspect is very, very important. Question remains, is it feasible with the popular flexible bendable electrodes as well? What about the shortfall in standards requiring further revision then? Uh, the altered low power design is also important because it provides suitable, is suitable for continuous long-term monitoring and leaves plenty of room in an IRT world, but the trade-off needs to happen between semiconductor noise and other performance. The flexible PCB design is also getting popular because it can bend and flex, provide greater degree of freedom in the design, but the cost is an important parameter, and also it's difficult to repair when it needs any further reorg. With silicon uh, not available uh, in the fashion that we would have liked, and there's appropriate amount of shortage, so there's some kind of revolution going on in the semiconductor industry with customized flexible IC design, particularly targeted for various form factors and cost, but the performance is an issue here. Question remains, will this technology then replace silicon in the future? Uh, I would like to thank everyone for the, attending this talk. Uh, it was lovely having you, and thank you. Would you have any questions for me? Thank you so much, Nisomia. Thank you. It was really, really interesting, and I enjoyed this talk so much. Um, I think we have some questions, if, uh, if I may. Uh, so one question would be, um, 
how much has your really research field evolved since you started working and how do you think it may develop in approximately over the next decade yeah i must emphasize that the field has significantly evolved ever since i first started working on it as a PhD student research on wearable technology incorporating the use of dry electrodes especially in smart garments are becoming increasingly popular in monitoring various physiological signals our body kinematics during sports exercise and even vital signs these signals are not only crucial in healthcare industry but also plays a crucial role in daily assisted living i believe uh, the next decade will further see the world making significant advances and progress in developing flexible sensing electrodes with excellent stretchability and conformability capabilities. They will be more widely investigated due to its diversity in their application in daily life, such as, again, healthcare monitoring, soft robotics, and physical rehabilitation. However, the wider research community will still have to address the fundamental challenges of these flexible sensors before they can even be commercialized, including sensing capabilities, calibration, mechanical stability, and noise performance, as I've already mentioned in the, my talk. Likewise, there will be also growing demand on continuous health monitoring by deploying ultra-low power hardware systems, as these multiple sensors keep getting connected in an internet of things. Thank you very much. Uh, there is also a question for you to answer in the chat. Yes. Thank you and we move on, thank you. Exactly. Thank you so much, Sami. Just one more question, if I may read it out from the audience. Um, please, if I may read it out, which circuit design software do you use for um, uh, for your research? So uh, I have used uh, uh, Multisim, the software by the National Instruments called the Multisim to uh, verify the designs. Uh, but it all practically came down to the bench test. So you have to physically build the circuits, prototypes and test it in the real world. So A, there was uh, physical, like, you know, theoretical calculations, design simulations, as you're probably pointing out, uh, for uh, circuits. So you have uh, multi-SIM, but there are other vendors as well, which sometimes occasionally are used by Texas Instruments called TINA. Uh, but for the PCB design, I used Eagle. Thank you so much. Thank you. I hope this answers the question. If there are any further questions, um, I will um, later after our um, talks concludes, leave all of our contact details and you're very, very welcome to contact us and ask about everyone's, every presenters and of course also our co-hosts and co research as well. Yeah, very open and to any questions. Thank you so much, dear Sonia. Thank you again for this very, very interesting and engaging talk. We've learned, I think, a lot. Um, but Please, can we proceed now to the next presenter, which is Farnas. And if I may introduce her, um, she received a bachelor's and master's degree in bioengineering, an MRS degree in neurotechnology, and is currently pursuing her PhD degree at UCL in bioelectronics and electrical engineering. And her talk will focus on a low power recursive IQ signal generator and the current driver for bioimpedance application. So I really look forward to this talk, Arnas. Um, if you please may share your screen Hi. with us. Hi, Anna. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, I first uh, would like to thank you uh, yourself and Dr. Said for providing this platform for us uh, to present our work. It's really a pl pleasure being part of this. So I just will share the slides quickly. Can you see them? Can you see the slide? Sorry. Okay, good. Uh, so uh, as uh, Jana mentioned, uh, this is uh, this talk is going to be on uh, my work on a low power recursive IQ signal generator and current driver for bioimpedance applications. Just a quick introduction on myself, my background. Uh, so, um, as you said, Yana, I have a bachelor's degree in electronic engineering and, uh, and um, a master's in bioelectronics, uh, um, uh, both uh, from Iran. And uh, then in 2019, I moved to um, London, uh, where I did an MRes at Imperial College London. Uh, and um, 
the work was mainly focused on um, front end design for uh, uh, neural stimulators. And uh, then uh, in 2020, I started my PhD at UCL. Uh, the work of my uh, PhD uh, mainly focused on um, stimulus circuit design for uh, electrical impedance tomography, which is uh, which I'm going to explain further in this talk. And then the second part, which I'm currently working on, is on uh, circuit design using organic transistors for uh, ECG measurement, which is quite related to uh, Somaya's work. Uh, it's for uh, making a multi-sensing EIP system. So here I uh, explain mainly the first part of my PhD, uh, which is uh, based on bioimpedance measurement. For those who are new uh, in this field, uh, so bioimpedance uh, measurement is a technique uh, uh, that is non-invasive and it has lots of applications. A popular one is electrical impedance tomography, which based on uh, the impedance you're measuring from the tissue, you can reconstruct an image, a non-invasive and real-time image that can be like a replacement, uh, not a replacement, but can be used alongside CT scan, MRI, and things like that. Uh, so the concept is basically based on injecting a small amount of AC current into a tissue through uh, two electrodes and then uh, recording the resultant voltage and that will give you the impedance, the bi-impedance, and uh, that will help uh, to um, uh, estimate uh, the composition of the tissue and, uh, as I said, um, making an image. So uh, the thing is that this um, voltage is a complex value and uh, therefore uh, the uh, amplitude and the phase is uh, important parameters that should be um, uh, actually extracted, uh, which will be do uh, that that can be done by um, IQ demodulation at the recording site. And um, uh, the frequency of uh, the injected current is um, uh, different uh, from applications to applications. So depending on um, uh, the focus area, the, uh, the subject under the test, uh, it can vary from um, low frequencies to up to a megahertz range. And uh, for our application, uh, we particularly uh, focused on uh, long application monitoring, uh, which normally the frequency range of up to 200 k uh, kilohertz is used, and that's the, uh, the uh, frequency range of uh, our system. Uh, so uh, uh, the uh, purpose of uh, this work was to design a low power um, IC. Um, we used a 65 nanometer technology. Uh, to make um, a signal generator and then a current driver for injecting the current um, through uh, uh, for for the bioimpedance measurement. Uh, so uh, first, I start with the signal generator part. Normally, the common practice is to use uh, uh, direct digital synthesizers, which are basically uh, a lookup table that the data is saved in, uh, but that will take up um, lots of memory and uh, uh, area. So we try to uh, use a different approach uh, using a quadrature recursive signal oscillator method. Uh, this will generate both in-phase and quadrature phase signals. So we can use the signal generator both for the current injection and also at the recording side for the IQ demodulation. And then um, uh, a pseudo-random number generator uh, needs uh, 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 is uh, needed here uh, to uh, add some dither to the signal, which I explain later. And then the, si the signal is converted to analog using Delta Sigma modulator and then reconstructed with an FIR filter followed by a low pass filter. I mean, a, a, a normal first order low pass filter. So um, the, uh, the signal generator part, uh, we use uh, this recursive uh, oscillator where uh, each data point is generated based on the previous da uh, uh, data points. And um, 
this could generate both uh, sine and cosine signal signals. What matters in such de a design is the number of multipliers because that can um, significantly add to the computational cost of uh, the design. The good thing about the design we chose is that it only has two amplifiers, so it's not that um, costly. And the frequency of the output signal is defined by the sampling frequency, which is basically the clock frequency, and also the value for the K, which can be defined by the user and uh, through UART uh, connection. And um, uh, it could generate like a wide range of frequencies. Uh, so uh, because this uh, pattern is Re uh, repeatable um, uh, of the pattern of generating the signal, we want to avoid uh, any periodic uh, spurious tones in the signal. And that's why we need to add dither to this signal and we use a, a, an 8-bit shift register uh, to generate that. And then the signal is fed into a delta sigma modulator at the first order uh, DSM. Uh, and this basically convert uh, the, A, uh, the uh, uh, I forgot to mention that uh, the signal generator uh, is a 32-bit uh, uh, module. Uh, so the data from there is 32-bit. And this DSM convert that to one bit. This adds a lot of quantization noise to the signal, but the good news is that this noise is well beyond the uh, frequency of interest. So we can easily uh, filter this out using a proper filtering. Uh, so uh, for that, uh, uh, we did uh, the filtering through two stages, FIR filtering and then uh, first order reconstruction filter. Uh, for the FIR filtering, what we need is, mm, uh, so this is a 32 tab FIR filter, we need 32 plus 1, 33 um, uh, shifted uh, copies of uh, the uh, DSM output. So uh, what FIR filter does is actually it uh, gets a weighted um, uh, average of these signals, and that's how it um, smooth the signal uh, and um, filter it out. Uh, this is designed, uh, the main uh, parameters of the filters are designed in MATLAB and then it is implemented um, in uh, uh, the circuit uh, in uh, Cadence. So uh, each of uh, the tabs have, has their own um, uh, uh, coefficients that uh, they are controlled by changing the size of these transistors in um, the current mirror um, uh, like um, branches. So next, now we have uh, the analog uh, signal that we want to inject. And now we want the current driver to inject the current. Why we need that? Because we uh, need an amplifier with a, a high output impedance. Uh, because we want to make sure that with uh, the impedance of the tissue changing, we still are injecting a fixed amount of current. This uh, uh, current uh, uh, driver is um, uh, supplied by a minus plus 0.8 volt power supply, and it can generate um, uh, up to 0.7 milliamp peak to peak current up to 200 kilohertz. So uh, what it does, uh, it's, uh, we want it to be balanced so that the amount of current we're injecting is same as the amount we are collecting, make sure we are not damaging the tissue and there is no um, uh, uh, common mode voltage at the output. Uh, so um, uh, through um, RS resistor, it measures the output current and if it's um, going high or down, it will control um, uh, the input of the amplifier and adjust it. So this is the detailed view of uh, the amplifiers. The input transistors are all, 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 uh, all of them are designed in um, uh, uh, saturation region a region in sub threshold so that um, uh, uh, so that they are 
to make sure they are low power. And um, uh, the output resistance for this amplifier is uh, 82 kilo ohm. And uh, changing uh, the load impedance from 100 ohm to 5 kilo ohm only changes uh, the uh, transconductance of this amplifier by 0.1 milliamp uh, uh, over volt. Uh, so um, it's reliable. Uh, now uh, we uh, have the whole circuit and uh, uh, the uh, digital part uh, works with 1.2 volt supply, the analog part with 1.6 uh, volt, and um, the uh, digital part consumes 0.8 milliwatt uh, of power and the analog part consumes 2.7 milliwatt. Um, this is the output IQ signal from the signal generator. Uh, the uh, phase shift uh, varies slightly at different frequencies, but is, uh, it is um, reasonable and acceptable. And um, this is the output from the current driver at 180 kilohertz. Um, so it's a balanced um, output current, basically. Um, so um, to conclude, um, here uh, a low power uh, recursive uh, signal generator and current driver were designed, and this is implemented on uh, an IC, a, a low area and low power IC. And compared to other works, uh, other work in the literature, uh, this um, uh, design. Um, had lower power consumption uh, compared to uh, with respect to the current it's generating and uh, the uh, bandwidth. So there are um, other designs uh, that can generate higher uh, current and have a wider bandwidth, but the um, power consumptions are much higher than this. So uh, that's from me. If there's any question, uh, I would be happy to answer. Thank you so, so much for this talk. Uh, I found this really, really exciting. And there are, actually, we have time for some questions. I'm very happy maybe if I can um, uh, read out the first question which we have. So, um, can I please ask, um, how does the matching between the transistors of the FIR fiber affect the signal quality? Sure. Uh, so, let me go back to my FIR filter. Yes, here. So uh, uh, we have a quite large number of transistors here. Uh, but the good thing about the FIR filter is like in current steering DAC, uh, the matching of the transistor really matters because uh, it, uh, it's binary weighted. So each tab is very different from the others. So any mismatch will really affect the linearity of the DAC. But uh, in Delta Sigma modulation, uh, my modulated DACs, and then afterwards the FIR filter, the mismatch only affects the notches in the filter. So uh, it doesn't, um, it's not uh, that it's affecting the linearity, linearity it just affects uh, uh, the filtering uh, of uh, the signal, which wouldn't be that much. But in any case, I, sorry, I uh, it might be fun, but I just wanted to show this is the uh, uh, Excel design of the layout of uh, the FIR filter I've done. So it was a huge number of transistors because each transistor, I mean, uh, the size of the transistors was uh, designed based on um, the coefficients, and uh, I used multiple fingers of transistor. Uh, uh, for one transistor, you can use multiple fingers. So uh, each color shows one transistor. So I spread them uh, in uh, throughout uh, the design to make sure that it's a kind of um, a symmetrical design, and uh, it minimized the mismatch effect. But in any case, you will have some mismatch, which would be again okay because of the nature of the FIR filter. 
Thank you so much. Thanks, I think this, this is really a very interesting design and that we have also hands-on um, uh, also results uh, showing. I think this is very interesting. If I may ask, uh, there is a second question for you. Um, how is the frequency rate for a specific application of the EIT chosen? Sure. So uh, that's a very good question. Thank you. So one thing uh, that... Um, uh, should uh, we should have in mind is that the frequency is uh, chosen based on uh, the fact that a human body's uh, 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 the tissue is uh, frequency dependent. So uh, the liquid part of uh, the tissue is mostly resistive, uh, while the capacitive part, I mean the uh, the uh, cell membranes are mostly capacitive. So based on that. Um, look like uh, higher frequency signals show the uh, more liquid part of the body and lower uh, lower frequencies uh, show uh, the, uh, the capacitive part. And uh, so for uh, applications where you want the volume and things like that, you go for the lower part and you want the liquid, you go for the higher one. And um, so for one, one more thing is that you can electrical impedance spectroscopy to uh, extract the frequency response of the tissue and see where the uh, higher contrast lies. And then uh, you can say that for this application, the best result can be achieved in this range. So um, that's also one method. Thank you so, so much. This explains it really, really well. I have fully understood it and uh, I think it's it's really interesting. I would be so happy to chat outside of this talk with you a little sure. later. And if anyone would be interested, please reach out uh, to any one of the presenters. I will um, share now also the um, site where you can see um, our contact details. Please reach out to me or Dr. Said, and we will be very, very happy to pass on the contact details of all our presenters. If I may say, we have a, a next presenter. It is um, Dr. Emma Fun. Uh, unfortunately, um, due to unforeseen circumstances, um, Emma um, uh, had a surgery, and uh, but she was very, very kind enough to record her talk for us. And uh, actually, uh, she provided her slides now with a recording so that we can have it now during our talk. If I may introduce Emma to you. Um, so uh, Emma did her uh, bachelor's, master's and PhD in electrical engineering. And she's currently a course coordinator and a lecturer at the Engineering Institute of Technology. She is also a senior member of the IEEE and a chartered engineer in electrical engineering. And she's very, very um, open-minded and kind. And please, if you want to reach out to her, you're very welcome. Hi, everyone. My name is Yung Yu Fan. I'm from the Engineering Institute of Technology. I'm very happy to present you in today's 10th early career talks. My topic is sustainability, which are the technological roadblocks. I'm from the electrical background. I did my bachelor, master, and PhD degrees all in electrical engineering, specifically in power systems. I have uh, professional certificates in Python and also in machine learning. I'm very passionate about renewable integration. I have extensive experience in teaching and uh, research in the engineering field. I'm a senior member of IEEE and a chartered engineer recognized by Engineers Australia in electrical engineering. Now here is an introduction. We look at the global warming. Hello. Urgency in this introduction. The left side of the graph shows the net global greenhouse gas, gas emissions. You can see if we want to limit the global warming to 1.5 degrees, we have to follow the blue curve. If we want to limit the warming to 2 degrees, we have to follow the green curve. No matter which curve we follow, we need drastic GHG emission reduction. Sadly, 
and very unfortunately, the current policy is following the red curve here. The right side is an example uh, about how far away we are falling behind each year in solving the global warming urgency. Uh, the top graph is from the Global Wind Energy Report in 2022, and the bottom one is from the report in 2023. Now, what is going on? Uh, on the left side, you can see uh, in the report published in 2022, it says if we want to um, meet the Paris Agreement or limit our global warming to 1.5 degrees, we have to install the offshore wind farms by four times as compared to the current speed. Now in 2023, what happened? This number is five times. Instead of getting faster, we are falling behind. Now we are looking at some effects of global warming. Of course, we know uh, in terms of global warming, there are many things we don't want to see. These things include um, floods, heat waves, drought, hurricanes, and so on, as shown in this picture. The right side has a picture of a kangaroo running from a bushfire. This, of course, is happening in Australia almost every year. It's only uh, getting worse, and that's very unfortunate. ICPP said, if we want to keep our global warming within 1.5 degrees, we must have deep, rapid, and sustained actions. This means the GHG emissions must be reduced by half by the year 2020, which is only seven years from now on. When it comes to sustainable options to us electrical engineers or power engineers. We usually go to clean energy. These uh, include clean energy sources and clean energy technologies. We have a list of uh, clean energy options here. Uh, we have wind power, solar power, hydrogen technology, nuclear power, hydropower, battery energy storage, and a lot of other clean energy and uh, storage techniques that you can think of. We must be open-minded. Why is that? The right side has a global wind turbine manufacturing capacity, which is also from the Global Wind Energy Report. It says uh, we have a 163 gigawatts capacity altogether. According to the report, we will use up this capacity by 2030. What happens after 2030? That means we cannot rely on one energy source like wind. We have to be very open-minded to look at all the available technologies and come up with new engineering solutions. We'll take a closer look at the promising and popular options in the next few decades. These include wind power, solar power, hydrogen, and battery storage techniques. Of course, they are all related to electrical engineering, which we are working in. But we also bear in mind that they are across all engineering fields, which include civil engineering, mechanical engineering, physics, material, uh, instrumentation control engineering, and chemical engineering. OK, now, when it comes to integration, we will need to look at more aspects, more specific fields, specific fields. This include data communication, asset management, metering technologies, especially smart metering, data security or cybersecurity, automation technologies, machine learning or AI techniques, which are essentially part of data science. It is very important as engineers that we have uh, some idea about data science because on the right side, as you can see in the smart grid, um, with the operation of the smart grid, we must have a very efficient and cost-effective data communication techniques and the data management systems. With a large amount of data, we need to know how to deal with big data, how to 
use the big data to help our grid to become more smart in a more efficient way. Okay, now we will use the data science in electrical engineering as an example to show how important it is to have multiple disciplinary knowledge. When it comes to big data, as we saw in the last slide, we have a lot in our smart grids. Okay, what kind of data do we have? We have uh, internal data and external data, broadly speaking. Okay, so the internal data will include uh, the field measurements, the uh, and, uh, data from the IEDs, the state databases, um, then the electricity market data as well. And the external data will include um, uh, like weather data, for example, solar irradiation, wind speed, the social networks data, the stock, uh, stock market data, and so on. So we have a lot, lot of data going on in our power grid. If we can utilize this data efficiently and intelligently, then we will be able to build a smart grid to better utilize renewable sources and uh, renewable technologies such as battery storage, and the hydrogen. Okay. How do we do this? There are a lot of things we can do by utilizing the big data in smart grids. We can predict failures for equipment. We can monitor the health condition of equipment and the system. We can predict power outage so we can be ready before the outage actually happens, or we can prevent the outage. We can manage our energy dynamically. For example, we have an uh, uh, energy uh, demand response, which allows the customers or the consumers to, uh, to participate in energy management. We can detect theft. We can do predictive maintenance not just preventive. We can have real-time customer billing, maybe based on peer-to-peer -peer energy trading. We can optimize asset uh, in our power systems. We can, of course, uh, look at the customer experience about various schemes from the energy market and improve accordingly. For all of this, you can see we have to have some knowledge in big data. We need to know how to retrieve the data, then how to make use of the data. That means we need to know data engineering and data science. You might be thinking, okay, I have uh, uh, data engineers and data scientists in my team to help me. Of course, that's a very good advantage if you have uh, those experts, but it's still very important for you to have some basic knowledge in this field. So in uh, terms of uh, collaboration, you will be able to uh, uh, provide some more uh, meaningful guidance or meaningful feedback uh, to the data engineers and data scientists. Of course, you can add a lot more to the list as you know more about what we can do with data. Okay, the conclusion about the technological roadblocks, as you can see, are basically about the multidisciplinary or cross-disciplinary knowledge in engineers, or I should say among engineers. We need to know a little bit about mechanical engineering, civil engineering. We need to know a little bit about automation, about control, about uh, data science to really be able to um, uh, organize all the information and uh, be able to contribute more in the uh, risk of solving global warming. As you can see, we just need to keep adding the knowledge all the engineering and science knowledge in our mind. Uh, this means we need to upskill. What we have learned so far is never enough. Although we have PhD or we have other higher education degrees, it's never enough. We have to upskill 
all the time. This means we need to have a, a lifelong learning, which uh, I think all of us are doing already. Another aspect is about collaboration. We need to know how to work with others. We cannot restrict ourselves in the electrical engineering field or even the engineering field in general. We have to work with, for example, policy makers. We need to influence them, direct them, and somehow convince them that um, some policies are very essential on the road to solve global warming crisis. And that eventually we will be able to work together and achieve the ultimate goal of controlling the global warming within 1.5 degrees. So all for my presentation. Thank you very much. I welcome any questions. Uh, I would like to thank the speakers, uh, the final year PhD students, uh, Tesneem from the University of Nottingham, uh, Dr. Somia from University of Galloway Island, uh, and the PhD students, uh, Farnaz from uh, College London, uh, University College London, and Dr. Amma uh, from University Institution of Technology from Australia. I'm, I'm very lucky to, to have the four of you today in the 10th early career talk. Um, we, 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 uh, your speakers are from England, from Ireland, from Australia. So this is a very nice uh, opportunity for all of you to listen to each other and uh, think about the topics that you might not uh, hear before because it's a little bit out of your comfort zone. I would like to thank the IEEE United Kingdom and ILET section and IEEE Region 8 the, and IEEE Women in Engineering and the uh, Industrial Internet of uh, Things Research Group at the University of West London for supporting and promoting our event. We are very grateful to our sponsors, speakers and attendees. Also, I would like to add, thank very much Dr. Yana for her uh, support for this event, uh, she, our new ambassador. Thank you so much, 